Okay, so I make that about 12 o'clock, so I may as well get started since I was last talk before uh, lunch starts. Uh, so my name is Mike Croft. Um, there I am on Twitter, uh, and I work for a small company called Pyara. Now, before I go any further, has anyone heard of Pyara already? One, two, that's always encouraging, just two. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, Pyara is derived from Glassfish. Uh, after some of you might know, Oracle stopped doing support for it. Uh, we picked that up, um, but I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, so firstly, uh, just a bit of a background uh, about me. Uh, I'm going to whiz through these slides a little bit because it's going to be mostly uh, demo. Uh, so my background is as a Java middleware consultant. I used to work for a company called C2B2. I did independent Java middleware consultancy, so any sort of Java EE app server, um, I'd just go and help whatever business uh, was using it. Um, I've since moved into Pyara support. Um, so Pyara actually came from the same company. So that although I've officially moved companies, I'm still within, the, you know, still working with the same people. Um, so my role is all the customer-facing stuff. So I get to see what customers are doing day to day, uh, how they're working with things, and uh, uh, all the problems that come with that. Uh, and there I am on Twitter again, and that's really what I would usually like to be doing. Um, so I want to get an idea about who who we've got in the room. So we've we got any developers in the room that are just doing development operations that are doing like administration management and stuff. None. A oh, one. Excellent. Cool. They're the sort of people that I normally work with. Anyone doing both? Yeah, a few, one or two. Okay, cool. Uh, anyone who's just like a dog's body who gets given whatever task is just on your manager's desk at that point. Yeah, yeah. there's always some of those as well. Um, so before we go any further, this is going to be a talk about cloud native Java EE. Uh, and I'm going to be using Pyara server uh, because I work for Pyara. That's the only real reason. Um, so there are other technologies out there that use Java EE uh, that are designed to be work to work with the cloud and work with microservices, but I'm just going to be using Pyara server and show you what the things that we've been doing to uh, to cope with the needs of cloud. So first of all, it's derived from Glassfish. That means it's got all the same code base as the Java EE reference implementation. Uh, so it's uh, got all the all the stuff in uh, Java EE seven. Um, we haven't done any sort of TCK work, so we can't officially say we're Java EE seven, but we use the same code base as Glassfish. Draw your own conclusions. Um, it's under the same license as Glassfish itself. So if you're a fan of Glassfish and you think that's great, um, everything that is in Pyara server is free for you forever. You don't ever have to uh, pay us for anything. Uh, where we make money is in uh, selling support and services. Uh, there is no part of the code base that we will ever charge for. It's all on GitHub. It's all there for you to uh, look into and use. Uh, and it's active. Uh, I think this is actually something that we've heard from the community. We've had testimonials to say, um, after having seen Glassfish, you know, kind of take a nosedive in activity, uh, seeing that there's people out there that are actually kind of willing to uh, commit to Java EE. Um, you know, you see a lot of activity in, in the Wildfly project. I think a lot of people were pleasantly surprised to see that uh, Glassfish has been kept alive. Um, and I will say, actually, we've just recently, uh, as in, in the past sort of week or so, uh, started a new uh, Five branch. Obviously, because we're derived from Glassfish as our upstream, uh, Glassfish 5 is going to support Java EE 8. Uh, we've just started a Five branch. Uh, and today, as in, I think, about 10 minutes ago, uh, we've integrated uh, the latest JSF. And I think next on the list is MVC 1.0. Uh, so you'll be able to download that, build it, uh, and have <coughs> uh, latest JSF, latest uh, MVC 1.0 to play around with without having to mess around with APIs and things. Uh, we release it quarterly. Um, again, that's just the public releases. We do monthly ones for customers. And there's always a snapshot build. Any build that we do is always uh, there as a pre-release. Pyara Micro is small. So Micro is obviously for microservices. Uh, that's basically the target for it. Um, we've tried to make it as small as possible. And what we've done is take, effectively, Glassfish's web profile, 
wrapped that and added a few extra things. So it also supports JBatch, it also supports JCash. Uh, and because it supports JCash, we've got Hazelcast as the provider for that. Um, I don't know if any of you were in Christoph's talk. Um, so him and his team are, are kind of effectively enabling all the elasticity that's in Pyara Micro. Uh, so all the kind of dynamic clustering and, and extra kind of funky stuff that Hazelcast adds, we then get that in Pyara Micro, and that's where we get a lot of our uh, cloud goodness from, which you'll see shortly. It's also fully embeddable. You can start it programmatically if you want to. Um, and we do also, with the last release, we've got now proper documentation. So before, we used to document it in, uh, on GitHub, on GitHub's wiki. Uh, we've now got proper documentation on Gitbooks, which I'm quite pleased about. Uh, yeah, and as I say, it's Web Profile Plus. And they're the Maven coordinates if you fancy getting them yourself. Uh, they're the APIs, as I say, Web Profile Plus yeah, uh, JPatch, uh, JCache. Nothing more to say on that. Um, so let's get straight into a demo. So hopefully I won't take too much time, but last time I did this, I ran over, and since then I've actually added to it. So uh, yeah, let's uh, see how we go. So this is going to be my uh, demo environment. So the first demo is, actually did that come up on the right screen? It probably didn't, did it? So the demo scenario, this just kind of go over my thinking for it. At the time I originally wrote all this presentation, um, the decision was between a fat jar or a skinny wire. Loads of people these days, uh, I see on mailing lists, are all about Uber jars and, or runnable jars, however you want to call them, uh, effectively packaging your business logic in with the runtime and just deploying it as a single unit. Um, a lot of people have been saying, yep, that's really the way forward, that's the future, that's how everything's going to go. Um, I, I'm not so sure, personally. Um, having worked with uh, businesses that are kind of new and cutting edge and really kind of startup mindset, and also businesses that are uh, only just now moving on to Java EE6. It's the, the Java EE world is so broad that I don't think you can really make that decision. So uh, when Pyara Micro was originally designed, uh, the decision was to go with the skinny wire approach. We thought, well, you can create a runnable jar, but uh, at the time, we didn't particularly see much benefit in it. Since then, and actually since I wrote this slide, we've actually um, added a feature which does package Pyara with your business uh, logic into a single runnable unit. Uh, I still don't see that there's a huge amount of real benefit to it. It's the same basic thing. And really what you're doing is uh, creating just a, a bigger thing to kind of pass around between different environments. Um, but if it fits the way you work, then we've got that option as well. Um, so we're going to use a skinny wire for the demo. Um, and again, as as far as uh, cloud goes and, and microservices, generally you want a RESTful API. And that's almost universal these days in these sorts of demos is uh, a demo of REST. And what we're also going to do is include uh, Jcash in that with Hazelcast. So we're going to see um, elastic clustering and, and the sorts of things that you need uh, for cloud deployments. Uh, I did think actually that if you pay attention to businesses like Oracle and their position on cloud, you'll see that they advertise uh, public cloud, which is kind of typical things that you might see from uh, AWS or uh, Microsoft Azure, but they'll also uh, offer things like hybrid cloud or purely on-premise, uh, which I think it just strikes me as marketing, to be honest. I don't think that there's really any differentiation between a traditional data center and an on-premise private cloud. Uh, the stuff that VMware have been doing for years really gives you that um, when you're running on-premise. And you still have that hard limit of, well, the amount of hardware you've got is the amount that you can use. Uh, whereas if you go fully uh, public cloud, as in uh, AWS, that um, obviously big companies like Netflix, Dropbox have all been really, really successful at, um, and I doubt that any of, or if many of us uh, here work at uh, any business with the sort of scale of Dropbox or, um, or Netflix or Pinterest or whatever. And they use something like AWS fine. Uh, 
The real advantage there is that there's no hard limit. You can scale and scale and scale and scale, and the only real limit is cost. So uh, I'm going to look at some traditional kind of hosts. We're going to ha just have local deployments on the laptop. I'm also going to deploy to Amazon EC2 with Vagrant. Obviously, Vagrant. Uh, has anyone used Vagrant before? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an overview of it. I won't won't dwell too much on that. Uh, Vagrant can be backed by anything. Well, anything that there's a plugin for. So if VirtualBox is the default, but you can also have a plugin for VMware, uh, which obviously you have to pay for because VMware is not free. Um, you can also have a, th there's a free plugin for EC2, which is the one that I'm using, uh, along with another plugin as well to keep things like secret keys uh, safe and secure. Uh, so I'm also going to look at containers as well. So we've got a couple of uh, Docker examples. Um, and really, to be honest, as I look through uh, cloud providers, uh, you know, we've got Pivotal's Cloud Foundry, which is also powering IBM's Bluemix. You've got Heroku, uh, Red Hat's OpenShift. All of them are proprietary. I don't really like that myself. Um, certainly as someone who works for a company like Pyara, we need to pick the one to support. And yeah, we've got limited resources, so which one do you pick? Well, for us, we thought, well, it's obvious you pick Docker because they all support Docker. Uh, you know, you don't need to write a proprietary um, deployment just to go for um, OpenShift or just Heroku that you might be using now, because that platform might introduce something that breaks your code or, or something that or some limitation that you discover too late to have to you know, undo all the work that you've done and then write it again or package it again for this uh, other platform. So we've gone for Docker because it will run basically anywhere. And I do know that there are customers that uh, I work with that are looking at OpenShift and actually are using OpenShift purely because it's, um, it's got Docker at its core rather than something like Cloud Foundry, which I, I had a couple of years ago expected was going to do better than OpenShift. Uh, and I might just show you that later if there's time. It's really just something that I use myself for development that I quite like. Um, so demo one. I'm just going to show you uh, the basics of getting up to speed with Pyara Micro. So as I said, we use uh, a skinny war rather than a runnable jar file. Pyro Micro itself is just a jar file. Uh, so the way we start it up is just java minus jar pyromicro.jar. What that will do is just start you uh, a Java EE application server, uh, which will support web profile and a couple of other APIs. So let's do that. And I'll need to drag this over to the other screen. Oh, this is difficult. OK. Uh, do I remember the shortcut? Excellent. Uh, OK, so this is going to be interesting because I can't see now, so I'll come down here. Oh, no, I can see. I've got the thing. OK. I'm just too short. That's my problem. So here I've got demo one. Uh, do we know what the resolution of the screen is? Yes. So what I'll do actually is, uh, actually I don't need a huge amount of resolution for this one. So what I'll do, uh, in this uh, folder you can see I've got pyromicro.jar. Uh, and all we do to run it, as I said, is just java minus jar pyromicro.jar. So while that's starting up, let's uh Yeah, excellent. Cool. Um so that started up. Uh nothing particularly different to uh, a normal Java E container. So if I wanted to do that again. Uh, we'll see it fail. And the reason why it fails is due to uh, port bindings. 
as you can guess, uh, it just starts up with uh, a default port of 8080, and because there's already one running with 8080, see that there's just a little bit of uh, Hazelcast clustering, it's now shutting down again because it couldn't start up. So we've uh, anticipated this as a, as a problem. Uh, and what we've done is add a extra option. Uh, and what I'll do actually is no hook that. Uh, and then you should see, if I just start a couple of these, then go back, what we should see, hopefully, is in this, uh, yep, there we go. So that's the first PyroMicro I started, and you can see we've got a couple of members there. Um, we should see a few more starting up fairly soon. It is all virtualized, so it's not the quickest in the world. There we go, so we've got six members. Uh, so I think this is a quite an important thing with um, when we're talking about cloud environments is that I don't want to have to think, I don't want to have to plan ahead and explicitly specify what ports, what IPs I want things to run on. I want to just say, just start me another. When you're talking about um, cloud, really, I think the a key benefit of it is elastic scalability. You want to just be able to dynamically just throw another thing at the cluster and for it to just cope. And that's a great thing that we've got with uh, Hazelcast here. So let me just kill that. Uh, now, I should say that when I uh, did this demo last time, I actually forgot to uh, I actually forgot to kill all these, and it completely broke the rest of my demo. So I'm going to make sure that I get this done right now. Probably shouldn't have started up quite so many. Sorry? All right. Hmm. This is what happens when you do things live. OK, cool, so that did work. Have I got a list of jobs I haven't? Cause it's, oh, there we go. It's a shame that my uh, virtual machine has dropped off the edge, but we'll... Well, I'll be quicker next time. I'll tell you why I'm being so uh, insistent on killing all these in a minute. OK. Cool. Right, so um, that was demo one. Let's go to demo two. Uh, really, what I've, yeah, that was what <laughs> I was doing afterwards. Um, we haven't actually shown anything deployed to it, so I haven't really shown anything particularly interesting other than just you can start a bunch of them without really thinking about it, without really planning ahead, uh, and that you can react dynamically. So, uh, demo two, uh, I'm using. Um, an example that's part of the PyR examples project. Uh, we've got a few different examples there. We've got uh, various different things that you can use and just check out and deploy straight to PyR um, just to see it working in action. Uh, so this is a REST and Jcash example. Uh, and this is how we use it. So there's, there's two ways that you can deploy to it. You can either just use minus minus deploy your WAR file, 
or you can use uh, minus minus deployment dir for my app. So if you've got uh, a particular service that's broken down into a couple of different resources, then you can deploy all those as well. Uh, and this is the code. Really, really simple. There's really not a lot going on here. Or the, the, there's more going on the, than you would perhaps think. So we've got at the top, we've got at get. Um, it's obviously a JAXRS um, REST annotation uh, to listen to HTTP gets that accepts, um, or sorry, that produces uh, JSON. Uh, and all we've done to integrate jcaching with it is aside from um, include it in the POM because it's not a, a Java E7 API. Um, cache results, uh, we've got a, a named cache in there of rest-j cache, which is just the name of the application. Um, a default value of no value. Um, and basically, you just supply the key, and it will just get the, the right value out of the cache for you without you really doing anything. Uh, so the, some of you might not actually be able to see the, the one at the bottom, um, but that's just the put method. And really, the, the only difference is that in the um, put JSON uh, method, uh, we've just got an extra at cache key and at cache value um, for to accept the value that you want to put. I've also got a couple of scripts just to save me on typing. Uh, so this is a script just to encapsulate curl for doing puts, um, put a few default values into the cache, uh, and another one here to do some gets. So let's do it here. So you can see there that's my uh, that's my put. So let's do let's do one. I did that start. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> OK, J and I error. That's quite fatal. So what are, we, what are we doing on time? So let's get on towards half past now. I've got more interesting things to show. I'm going to abandon that because there's some similar stuff uh, available as well. Uh, so did that just die? Yes, it just died. Excellent. So let's move swiftly on. <laughs> This demo has never played nicely. There's always been something that's gone wrong. Every, every single time, it's something different that fails for me. Um, always works in practice as well. Just did it just now this morning. Everything worked perfectly, as it obviously does. So demo three, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Vagrant. So Vagrant, for those of you that don't know, uh, is backed by VirtualBox by default. You can also supply different things. So in this example, I'm using uh, an AWS plugin and an ENV plugin. Uh, has anyone used AWS before? One, two, cool. So uh, AWS is just the name for Amazon Web Services. There are lots and lots of different ones, but EC2 is the uh, Elastic Compute Cloud. That's where you start up your uh, virtual machines, effectively, in the cloud. Uh, it comes with um, some nice command line tools, and as part of that, to uh, log in via the command line, it gives you a, a secret key and an access key, uh, which are just sort of two long generated strings that you just pass through, and they're super secret. Um, if you search through GitHub for them, you will find a lot of people's uploaded uh, access keys and secret keys. Um, so I didn't want to fall into that trap, so I've used the ENV plugin, 
which just allows you to specify a file called .env, and it will pick up all of the uh, environment variables from that. Uh, so yeah, uh, I just wanted to point out as well that uh, this is just a demo. It's not really an amazing way of doing things. Um, a better way is to use something like uh, Chef or Ansible or something that's uh, really designed to work with this sort of thing. So let's uh, full screen that. So this is my uh, Vagrant file. Oh, no, that's not my Vagrant file. That's my user data file. There's my Vagrant file. So uh, ordinarily, you would have config.vm.box equals whatever box you need. So if you use Docker and you would say um, Ubuntu slash trusty, for instance, uh, for, obviously, yeah, you can see, just copy that above there. Um, for the AWS plugin, we need to use a dummy box. Just It's not actually a real box at all, but it's just something that uh, Vagrant can see and, and not complain about. Uh, then the key bit, let's just highlight this here, is this bit here. So you've got vm.provider is AWS. Uh, and then we've got the env plugin. Um, if we got a, yeah, there we go. The env plugin with the access key and the secret key, uh, which obviously need to remain secret. I'm using the EU central region, which is based in Frankfurt. There's the key pair name. Um, Let's see further down. So we've got a particular AMI. Now, the AMI is an Amazon machine image. That's something that we've already saved and snapshotted before. Uh, so in your, in your own deployments, you would either pick one that's already been uh, created and provided on the marketplace or uh, something that you manage yourself. Now, the downside of Amazon's AMIs is that that AMI ID is completely fixed. I say downside. It's, it's good in a way because you always know exactly what you're building on top of, but what it doesn't do is update. So that actually is a little bit old now, uh, a good few months old. So spinning that up, you are also spinning up vulnerabilities. So that's really something to uh, be aware of if you wanted to do this sort of thing for production. Uh, if you're using uh, Amazon and its machine images, uh, which you would be for, uh, for this sort of deployment, you really need to be aware of that and, and to be careful that you're not um, starting up a very old machine each time. Instance type t2.micro is the smallest one that we can get, um, or the, the smallest current generation, anyway. I have to supply a particular subnet. Uh, There's just some of the networking that uh, AWS gives you. Um, what else have we got? Uh, so I've, I've named it so that we can see actually uh, in, in the console, which one's which. Um, got some security groups. The user data, this, is, this was the file that I was just looking at. This is the uh, this is a shell script that we provide to Amazon to just say, OK, when you start up, run this script, and then you'll be provisioned, and you'll be ready to, to do some work. Uh, yeah, so I've done a bit of overriding of the um, uh, private key as well. So with Vagrant, when you do Vagrant up, it will bring up a virtual box image, and it will generate its own private key for you. So you do need to uh, specify your own Amazon private key, otherwise you won't be able to log into the, any of the things that you started. Uh, and now just down here that you probably can't see, uh, I've got config.vm.define1234. Uh, and this is really just for Vagrant's benefit, so that we know uh, which one's which. I'm just talk about this. Uh, this is the hazelcast.xml file. Now, obviously, locally, when we were starting up loads of uh, instances, we were just using multicast, just so that you can start things up and they just discover each other and join, and it's all uh, very nice. So you can see, again, I need to have some dummy access key and secret keys in there to use this um, part from the hazelcast.xml. I should say that, actually, that this is something that we're passing directly to Pyara Micro, so you can supply any sort of extra config file, and it will override the defaults. So here we're overriding the default multicast joiner, because that doesn't work in cloud environments, um, or not without some extra effort. I know that if you're using Jelastic, they've got ways around that. Um, we are specifically using the AWS joiner uh, in Hazelcast, which provides you a way to just supply 
the region that you want to look at. Um, and then we've got the, yes, here we go, the interface. So that's the interface that I want it to uh, scan through. Uh, and when you start it up, it will just do a bit of uh, scanning on a particular IP range only in that region, uh, and Bob's your uncle, basically. There is also a TCP joiner, which this basically extends. So even if you're not on Amazon, if you're on Azure or any other sort of cloud environment, you can just sort of give a range of TCP addresses. addresses. Um, I would expect that you should have some sort of control over at least the private networking. Um, that's how we can get around the lack of multicast with Hazelcast. Uh, lastly, just quickly, uh, this is the userdata.sh. Uh, so all we've got is just some stuff where we're provisioning PyR Micro, we're downloading the um, pre-release. Let's actually just scroll this up a little bit. There we go. Uh, so yeah, we're doing a wget on the hazelcast.xml from GitHub, doing a wget on the uh, WAR file itself, and do a jar of minus jar for all of it. So, okay, right. Here we are then. These are all the files that we've got. So with your Vagrant file, um, I should say actually that I've already started this before. And when you start a Vagrant instance, it gives you a .vagrant directory. Uh, and if I just tree that, you can see actually there also, I've got the uh, .env file with all the uh, secrets in. So that, that's all the stuff that gets created when you start up a Vagrant instance. Um, AWS scenario. We've got a directory for each box. Uh, there's minimal amount actually stored on there, so it doesn't really use it that much disk space. So if I then do Vagrant up, what it's going to do is restart those instances that I've already created, or at least try to. I'm not sure whether I actually deleted these. I might have. No, oh, no, I haven't. So this is the uh, AWS dashboard. Here you can see that pre-existing instances. Uh, I won't show you recreating them because it just takes a long time, and I'm uh, just conscious of getting everything done, allowing for questions as well. So now we can see that they're all starting up. Excellent. The Wi-Fi has been good. It's always good when at least one of your demos works. Uh, See so yeah, what we're doing is just waiting for SSH to become available. So this is the um, it's overriding the private key that it would generate itself normally with the private key that we want it to use. And eventually, what we should be able to do is use the the get and the put uh, shell scripts. So. OK, so that's finished. Uh, now, what you'll see as well, actually, is that it's um, it says rsyncing the folder. Uh, with Vagrant, the way that you transfer files in and out of a virtual box machine is that you just put it in the same directory that your Vagrant file is in. That directory will just get uh, automatically mirrored between your environments. The way that it does it with um, the AWS plugin is that it just uses rsync. So do be aware, don't put huge files in that directory, because it's going to be all synced up to however many things that you start up. <coughs> so let's, let's get an IP address. Actually, I can just show you uh, with Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant SSH uh, 1. Excellent. I thought if any of my demos were going to fail, I thought this one was going to be it. So um, 
if I just list the contents of slash vagrant, you can see that everything that I had uh, locally has now been pushed up into the cloud, uh, and we can do um, Oh, of course. Let's just use default values. Connection refused, excellent. It's not started. So uh, yeah, the reason why that's not started is because when I <laughs> when, when I did it backstage, uh, you might have noticed that in the um, yeah in the user data file, the the last thing to to run is actually just starting up the WAR file. So what I haven't done here is anything that will uh, get that to, to Begin on startup. Thanks. Um, if you were to, if you were to do this properly, uh, then you would just add something in to uh, to make this start on startup. Something like create it as a service. Uh, so that's really just more of a limitation of my own demo there. Uh, like I said, I, I won't just blat them away and restart them because it'll take a long time and I'm running short. Um, again, I mean it's the same basic demo that what I'm really showing here isn't the uh, the WAR file and the few scripts that I've made, it's the, uh, it's the technology behind them. So demo four, this is where we go to Docker. Uh, so a really, really simple script just to run a series of Docker containers. So you, just, you can do run.sh with a number, uh, and then it will just run that many of them. Uh, and they'll be called py-micro-number. How many of you have used Docker before? Lots. OK, how many haven't used Docker before? OK, yeah, enough. OK. Um, so uh, Docker is very, very similar to Vagrant, um, but a little more lightweight. Um, the, the way that Docker is most like Vagrant, actually, I think, is with Docker Compose. Um, but here is the Docker file that's backed by that. This is just something that I've made for, for demo purposes. Uh, we do have official Pyara Docker files, which will do all this for you, but I wanted to show you a, a particular option. This one right at the top that I'm drawing from is just um, uses Alpine Linux, which is um, a full Linux Docker container, which um, takes up, I think, actually just five megabytes, the container image itself. So if you look at uh, a completely plain Ubuntu or Debian Docker image, you'll see that it takes up something like 900 meg for a single con uh, single container image, uh, which I just think is huge. It's ridiculous. Uh, so Alpine Linux to me is properly micro for, for Docker. Um, there's a few different things that we do in here. So we've uh, set a few environment variables. Uh, again, really, really similar to the Vagrant example. Uh, identified the WAR file, identified the Hazelcast config file. Uh, so again, this is just so that we're using, um, they'll cluster together properly. Uh, we've also got, yeah, the, the file name that we're kind of downloading. And I'm basically, I'm just downloading the, the thing itself and, and provisioning it. So you can imagine that if you're using something that wasn't Pyara, you could just give uh, a Nexus repository endpoint or a, a Jenkins um, endpoint that you would publish from your CI builds uh, and just drag that down. The one that I'm using is chopped off, but that, <laughs> that URL, if you could see the end of it, that's actually pulling down the pre-release build, so it's always the very, very latest PyR micro that's coming down from that. So let's do a quick demo of that, very quick. Uh, again, yeah, that you can see the uh, run to sh. So you can see, actually, I've updated this slightly just so that it will um, use this minus p uh, thing to create the port. So whatever number container it is, it will have that, that number, 0, 080. Oh. So container 1 should be 1080, container 2 should be 2080. 
So let's do dot slash run three containers. Excellent. So we can do docker ps to see what's running. Uh, and we've got three there. Yeah, we can see we've got Pyro Micro 1, Pyro Micro 2, and Pyro Micro 3. So if I do put into uh, 1080, um, See, this is why I like Docker. This is always the one that I'm most sure is going to work. Uh, <laughs> this is why. <laughs> so, excellent. No error. Brilliant. That's good. So, if I do uh, dot slash get, um, let's get that from container three. Ah, I need to actually. Excellent. Let's just do that again. Let's put it into container two. And do dot get from container one. Dot sh, thank you. <laughs> cool. So you can see, I mean, all that really is um, from the power of Hazelcast. This isn't something that's really unique to Pyara. It's you can do it without really thinking about it with Pyara. Um, but Wildfly has InfiniSpan. Um, obviously, you can use Hazelcast with whatever you want. But all of the stuff from the uh, WAR file that we're deploying is actually just standard um, standard JCash API. So just got a few minutes left. So I'm going to quickly. very, very quickly show you that we've got another demo here. Um, and this is just using Docker Compose. Uh, so we've got two Pyro micros starting on 1080 and 2080. Um, let's do... Kill all those. Uh, and if I go to this one, see that there we got the Docker Compose YAML file. All I need to do is the same way that I just went into the directory. Uh, there's the YAML file. Uh, and the same way that I did Vagrant up with the previous one, I can do Docker Compose up here. And what it's going to do is uh, recreate the containers that I just had. All of the uh, output from those is obviously just being attached straight to the console. And you can see which one that you're starting up here. Uh, but for me, this, combined with something like uh, Docker Swarm, is what really makes things uh, cloud ready. You can see that all of these sort of cloud tools, I've not really had to configure Pyro Micro at all, other than use a minus minus deploy command and a minus minus auto bind HTTP command. Uh, I've also got auto bind uh, SSL if you wanted an SSL port. Uh, but this is exactly the same thing. So if I was to uh, do the same kind of demo as before, let's actually just go back here and reuse this. So you can see that actually that's still there. Uh, and that, that's basically it. So I think I've actually run out of time to show the, uh, the the bonus bit. I might have time for one question, I think. One or two. Actually, I mean, there's only lunchtime next. So if there's no other questions, you can always come and see me after. Excellent. I'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs>